I'm back with we're talking about is it about the church or is it about Jesus the question I could ask if if there was no more churches if there was no more churches absolutely no more churches could we personally could we personally be other to to do what we are doing and I have just lost my my it's Romans that's right so if it's about the church or is it about the about Jesus now the question is if there was no longer a church or no longer a building could we still meet open forumly or the question is would we find that too uncomfortable and would we find that too much overbearing how do we behave moving from theology to practical Paul gives us guidelines for living as a redeemed people in a fallen world we are to give ourselves to Christ as a living sacrifice obey the governments love our neighbors and take special care of those who are weak in faith he closes with a personal remark throughout the section we learn how to live our faith each day Romans 12 Romans 12 1 and 2 God is a good and pleasing and a perfect plan for his children he wants us to be transformed people with renewed minds living to honor and obey him obey God because he wants us only what is best for us and because he gave his son to make our new lives possible we should be joyfully giving ourselves as a living sacrifice for his service Christians are to con- accord 12 2 Christians are called to not to conform and no longer to the patterns of the world with its behaviors and customs it's usually selfish and of- often corruption corrupting Many Christians wisely decide that much worldly behaviour is off limits for them. We must go deeper than the level of behaviour and customs. It must firmly be planted in our minds. To be transferred by the re- transformed by the renewing of your mind, it is, to, it, it is possible to avoid most worldly customs and still be proud, conv- convectious, selfish, stubborn and arrogant. Only when the Holy Spirit renews the reductance and redirects our minds are we truly transformed Um, if we go to Romans 8 verses 5 we can see that in Romans 8 verses 5 those who are living according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what the nature desires but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires the mind of a sinful man is death, but the mind of a controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God, and it does not submit to God's law, nor it can do so. These are controlled by a sinful nature, cannot please God. 9. You who are controlled by a sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. And verses 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. And verses 12, therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to sinful nature, you will die. But if you by the spirit, you are put to death. The misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God or the daughters of God. For you did not receive the Spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the Spirit of sonship. And by him cry, Abba, Father. 16. The Spirit himself testifies our spirit that God's children. 17. Now if you are children, then we are heirs and heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. And indeed we share his suffering in order that we may also share his glory. We've got to share in the suffering to share in the glory. So it's not all roses. It's like this. If you are a Christian and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's about the suffering. It's about to be able to go into the fire, come out of your comfort zones and stay in that fire. (coughs) But unfortunately, there's a trend and a... It seems to be trendy to be in a clicky group in a church... And I challenge churches out there that we need to bring more p- 
people into God. Why can't the churches somewhat accept sinners in their churches? I don't understand this. I don't understand that when a sinner comes into the church and a sinner says, well, I'm drinking six bottles of whiskey a day, but the person, when the person comes to the church, the person's sober and the person's not doing anything wrong. But somehow Christians have got it wrong. They seem to want to condemn. They seem to not approve of this. And just in my... Um, just in my sermons before, I was looking at the Good Samaritan. And when looking at the Good Samaritan, we were looking at the collections of attitudes. The experts of the law, the wounded man was subject to disgust. The robbers, the wounded man was somewhat used to exploit. The religious man, the wounded man was a problem so that to avoid. We're not to be religious. Jesus is not interested in us being religious. And he's not interested that... We see a person as a problem, so we should avoid it. We shouldn't be seen to be an innkeeper and somehow show, see them as a customer and make them pay for it or, or a fee for it. But we need to be seen as the Samaritan's heart, that part of the heart. The wounded man was a human being worth being cared for and loved. And Jesus, of course, all of them and all of us were worth dying for. Confronting the needs of others to bring out various attitudes in us, Jesus used this story. Good despise the Samaritan and make clear what attitude is acceptable to Jesus. If we're honest, we o often we find ourselves in the place of experts of law needing to learn again who our neighbour is. Love your neighbour as yourself. Luke, obviously Luke 10 verses 25 and on. So the question is, can we, can we be Christ-like? Can we forget about you know, it's it's not about the building and it's not about the church, but it's about the people. If if we say there's unity in a church, but in comes this vagabond, in comes this person off the street, he hasn't had a shower for six months, he stinks, he smells, what do we do? We alienate this person, we treat this person like they don't exist. No one talks to this person, maybe to the exception there might be one. And they leave the church feeling unwanted. They leave the church feeling no one cares. And in Romans, as we were talking about before, says, especially about caring for the people that specially needs, needs help, that are suffering. So the simple fact is, is that we need to challenge ourselves, church. We need to challenge ourselves. Can one of us, every Sunday, bring a new person to church? That would be the question. Can one of us, every Sunday, bring a new person to church? And can we continue that, bringing a new person to church every Sunday? The question to myself is, I think that's a hard task to do. But is it possible? I think it is possible. I think we need to get out there, church, and I think we need to get out there and share the love of Christ. It's not a matter of being religious and Bible bashing people and hitting people over the head with the Bible, but it's a matter of getting out there and talking with people. It's a matter of showing people that we care. See, we can interpret and we can misinterpret and, and get it all wrong about someone. Paul, the apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy of our brother to the church of God, the Corinthians, together with all the saints through Acacia. Verses 2, grace and peace to, to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of all comfort. Praise to be God, the Father of ours. So this is 2 Corinthians 1. Praise to be God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so we can comfort those who are in trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God for just as the suffering of Christ flowed over into our lives also the Christ our comfort overflows if we are distressed it is for your comfort and salvation if we are comfort it is for comfort which reduces your patience and endurance the same suffering we suffer and our hope for you is the firm because we know that just as you share in our suffering so also you share in our comforts we do not want to be uniform, un, uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. 
We've under great pressure, far beyond our abilities to endure, so that is sp to spared even of life. Indeed, in our hearts felt sentence of death, but this has happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raised the dead. He would deliver us from such deadly pearls. He would deliver us. On him we sent our hope, and we continue to deliver us. As we help us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favour granted us in the answer of our prayers of many. So, I think that we need to consider, is it about church or is it about Jesus Christ? Do we lose the focus about what really the church is about? Do we tend to go overboard and, and forget about those people that are in need, those people that need to hear God's message? For instance, in China a long time ago, the only way to get the message of God out there is, is that they had these inns. And the travellers and the tradespeople would go and they'd sleep in these inns. And what that would happen is somebody would read the Bible and read the stories out of the Bible. And this is, and they like that. And this is one way of a mission, one way of getting God's message out there. We don't see in libraries today, we don't see where someone is reading the Bible in libraries. We don't see enough happening about saving souls for Christ in Revelation 20, it does state that, you know, we all want our names in the book of life because the second death is thrown into the lake of fire and none of us want to be thrown into the lake of fire. So, so you know, we can see in Second Corinthians 10, Paul defends his authority. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, I poor, who I am timid when face to face with you, but bold when away. I beg you, when you I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect towards some people who think we have lived by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On contrary, they are divine powers to demolish the strongholds. We demolish arguments at their very pretension and sets itself against the knowledge of God. And we take up captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once disobedient obedience is complete. You are So what the saying there is, and we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once obedience is complete. Paul defends his authority here. In verses 7 of 2 Corinthians 10, it goes on to say, You are looking only on the surface of things. If anyone is confident that he belongs to Christ, he should consider again that we belong to Christ just as much as he or her. For even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord gave us in building you up rather than pulling you down, I will not be ashamed of it. I do not want to seem to be trying to be frighten you with my letters. For some say his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unprecedented, and he is speaking amounts to nothing. Such people should realize that we are in our letters when we are absent, and we are in our actions when we are in present. We do not dare to classify, classify or compare ourselves with some who com commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond proper limits that we confine our boasting. We're not going too far in our boasting as we would case if we had not come to you. For we did not get it as far as you with the gospel of Christ. Neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting the work done by others. Our hope is that your faith continues to grow and the area of activity among you greatly expand so that we can preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. For we do not want to boast about the work already done in other man's territories, but let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is the one who com commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. The question here is, church, is that we need to look at what we are doing. And we need to look at what we're doing and how we're doing. 
and if we look at the unity in Christ and if we are unity and one with Christ